Hello there. My name is Andrew Reed, Juris Doctor, and today we will be reviewing an introduction to Canadian constitutional law. Part 1 Introduction What is the Constitution? The Constitution of Canada involves overarching documents of liberties, duties, procedures, both written and unwritten and the relationship of people with the government. The Constitution establishes legally enforceable obligations and serves as ground for judicial decisions. The Constitution is an important symbolic role, has an important symbolic role as the fundamental values of society. The amendment formula is federal approval and at least two-thirds of the provinces accounting for 50% of the population. What is included in the Canadian Constitution? Written, you have the Constitution Act of 1867. You have the Constitution Act of 1982. Uh, at section 52, uh, parentheses 2, outlines other documents like the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. You have the Supreme Court Act. Supreme Court case states that this is a constitutional document. Finally, you have judicial interpretations in common law, which are decisions that are guides to understand what these provisions mean. Then you have the unwritten constitution, which cannot be enforced in court, but has political repercussions. These uh, involve constitutional conventions, things that have always been done, ID, uh, in other words, the idea of a responsible government. There are five major features and principles behind the Canadian Constitution, including parliamentary democracy, ensures general laws are made by elected legislative bodies. You have federalism, which is the division of power, division of government along territorial lines. You have individual and group rights, claims that citizens have the right to democracy and conduct their lives as they choose. You have aboriginal rights. Aboriginal people belong to Canada, but they have lived on the land long before Canada. Finally, principle of constitutionalism that governmental action can be of no force or effect if inconsistent with the Constitution. One Supreme Court on this is the Succession of Quebec, 1998, um, 2SCR 217. Facts. After 1982 Constitution Act uh, amendment, Quebec was upset and the government asked the Supreme Court of Canada a reference question. Issues. Under the Constitution of Canada, or international law, can the National Assembly, legislator, or government of Quebec affect the succession of Quebec from Canada unilaterally? The conclusion was no. The rule is, no province can unilaterally secede from the country without following the constitutional amendment framework. We have unwritten principles, unwritten principles of unconstitutional law that must be looked at in addition to the written ones. Analysis. First step. Is this justiciable? If it is a legal question, it's justiciable. If it is political, then it is not. Yes, it is a legal question. Second step, addressing the question before the court. Because there was no precedence, the court had to figure out how to interpret, interpret the Constitution. There was a gap in the written Constitution to answer the questions. Therefore, the court had to use unwritten principles. Next, identify the four unwritten principles. Principle one, democracy. The political system of majority rule. The promotion of self-government. Canada is a constitutional democracy. Principle two, federalism. The division of power, the sharing of power by two governments. The divisions of powers in section 91 and 92 
of the Constitutional Act of 1867 is the primary expression of federalism in the Canadian Constitution. It is the central organizing theme of our Constitution. Principle 3. Rule of Law and Constitutionalism. The rule of law is law applies to everyone. Constitutionalism means that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Principle 4. Protection of minorities. Quebec argued they are a minority that needs protection. Their fear was to lose their language and lose their culture. Uh, specific constitutional provisions protect their minority language, religion, and education. The conclusion to this case was that unilateral succession is unconstitutional. However, if there is a clear majority on a clear question, the government has the responsibility to enter into negotiations to try and resolve the issues. The Clarity Act was the legislative response to this case. It gave the federal government the authority to determine whether the question was clear and whether it was a clear majority. Section 2. Judicial Review and Constitutional Interpretation Judicial Review The power that the courts have to determine, when properly asked to do so, whether action taken by a government body or a legal actor is not compliant with the Constitution. Judicial Review can get to court into two different ways. One, ordinary litigation, uh, with the rule of standing and two reference questions standing is those with a sufficient interest in a legal issue to raise it before the court can include interveners and public interest standing to be granted at the discretion of the courts uh, so interveners and public interest standings do not necessarily have a sufficient interest in a legal issue unless determined by the court reference questions allowed as per the Supreme Court Act. Judicial review is an obvious thing now, but not at the time of Confederation. Uh, it was thought at that time that the federal government could answer everything. Next part, constitutional interpretation. It is an important question to ask of judicial review. How judges interpret constitutional documents? What sources of guidance are able to be used and which ones are actually used? six types of arguments one historical the argument that marshals the intent of the draftsman of the constitution argument two textural the argument is drawn from the consideration of the present sense of the words three doctrinal an argument from previously decided cases four prudential argument about cost and benefits also called a practical argument five ethical argument relies on the institutions and the roles within them. 6. Structural. Inferences about existence of the Constitution, the structures, and the relationships that it ordains. Reference re meaning of the word persons in Section 24 of the BNA Act, 1867. Uh, Supreme Court Case 276. Facts. Reference question. The famous five petition the government to bring this question to court. Issue. The question. Are women included in persons? Based on Section 24 of the BNA Act, 1867. No. Rule. Would not use a rule from this case since it was appealed to a higher court. Analysis. The Supreme Court decided to address the question not by saying if women were persons, rather if they were qualified. To answer, we have to look at the words of the legislation as well as the intent of the legislation. Extrinsic evidence. British case law, some American case law, and the BNA Act of 1867. Intrinsic evidence. Provisions within the BNA Act to give clues to the intention of this provision. Was an originalist historical approach. What was intended when this document was written? in 1867. The problem with this is that the Supreme Court of Canada was not willing to evolve the Constitution to the present time. Based on women's status, 
They do not have the legal capacity to participate. They are not able to deal on the same level as men, similar to minors and criminals. The rules of statutory interpretation were also used. Uh, for example, the Lord Brougham Act, which is said not to apply to this case because the words used in the Constitution were gender neutral already. Conclusion, that women were persons, but they were not considered to be qualified. Therefore, they were not eligible for the Senate. Uh, later on, we have the Edwards versus the Attorney General of Canada in 1930 in the Appellate Court 123. So the person's case was taken to the Privy Council in England to appeal the Supreme Court of Canada decision. Issue, are women included in persons based on Section 24 of the BNA Act? And the answer this court came to was yes. And this rule, which is still intact, is women are qualified persons eligible for the Senate. And they created the establishment of the Living Tree Doctrine. Analysis. The Constitution is meant to be long-standing, but it is not meant to be static to the time it was made. We cannot possibly live by these rules because society has changed. Looking at the provisions about the Senate, there was nothing to say women were to be excluded. Looking at other provisions in the Act, there was specific mention of males and not persons. Therefore, if women were meant to be excluded, it would have been explicitly stated. The BNA Act planted in Canada a living tree capable of growth and expansion within its natural limits. The object of the Act was to grant constitution to Canada. Like all written constitutions, it has been subject to development through usage and convention. The conclusion of this case, Edwards versus Canada, is that women are eligible for the Senate, and the way that the Constitution is interpreted is important for the outcome. Part 2. Federalism. Interpreting the Division of Power. Federalism. The idea of division of powers between federal and provincial government, as per sections 91 and 92 of the Constitutional Act of 1867. There are three types of arguments that can be used to challenge legislation on division of power grounds. Argument 1. Validity. Arguments focus on whether the legislation in question was enacted within the head of power's jurisdiction or within the exclusive jurisdiction of the other head of power. Subsection A, Pith and Substance Doctrine. Subsection B, Double Aspect Doctrine. Subsection 3, Ancillary Powers Doctrine. Argument 2, Operability. The argument is used to limit the operability of provincial statutes. Even if the provincial statute is valid, it will be rendered inoperative if it conflicts with valid federal leg legislation that also applies to the same facts. Subsection, Doctrine of Federal Paramountcy. Argument 3, Applicability. Even if the legislation is valid and within the jurisdiction of the enacting level of government, it may be limited in its application. So, not to impair the core function of a federal provincial undertaking. It technically could be used to protect either federal or provincial powers, has only been used for federal powers so far. Subsection, the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity. Case, Citizens Insurance Co. versus Parsons in 1881 in the Appellate Court 96. Facts, Ontario had specific leg legislation about the particular requirements of fire insurance policies to be valid. Parson had insurance policies to cover fire damage. He tried to make a claim and was denied, as the insurers said, the policies were invalid. Parson claimed they were invalid because the insurers did not follow the Ontario legislation. Insurers acknowledged they, did not, they didn't follow legislation, but claimed it was because the legislation was ultra vires. Issues. Does the act in question fall with any classes of subject enumerated as section 92? 
Answer here, yes. If so, does the subject of the act also fall with any other of the classes of subsection 91? The answer here is no. And the rule here, it is important to classify the most appropriate head of power for legislative schematics when considering its validity, done by determining the scope of the relevant heads of power and whether the law fits within that scope. Analysis. We look specifically at subsection 91, uh, section 91, and section 9213, section 912, section 9213. Insurer said it was not valid because section 912 gave federal power over trade and commerce. Parson claimed it was valid based on section 9213, as was a provincial power of property, civil rights, contracts. Uh, so we need to look at the legislator with reference to the section in both heads of power and look at the language used to reconcile the respective powers contained in the given effect in each. If the insurer's argument was accepted, that would give the federal government the power to regulate all contracts. Uh, it was decided that if Section 91 did mean to include all contracts, it would not have specified some specific contracts in other provisions. Therefore, it was not meant to be included. All contracts was not meant to be included. Uh, consider the subsections of Section 91 that pointed out other classes enumerated to the Dominion's power, inferring that the use of the word trade was not meant to be sufficiently broad to include every type of trade. Otherwise, other types of trade would not have been specifically noted. The conclusion was that the Ontario Fire Legislation was a valid exercise of the provincial power under section 92. Validity argument, pith and substance doctrine. The first step in judicial review in the context of the division of powers is to identify the matter of the law, which is done by looking for the dominant feature of the law or its pith and substance. In determining the matter of the law, courts must con consider things like statutory context, purpose of the legislation, effects of the legislation, but ultimately the dominant inquiry is into the underlying problem that the legislation is trying to address. Once the matter of law has been identified, it is necessary to assign it to a specific head of power based on the enumerated categories of sections 91 and 92 of the Constitutional Act of 1867. Case, R. V. Morgan Teller, 1993. As facts, accused performed 14 abortions at his clinic. He was acquitted at trial, and decision was upheld as appeal. Was upheld on appeal. So after the abortion was decriminalized in 1988, rumors about Morgan Teller uh, opening a freestanding abortion clinic started in early 1989. Within a few months, temporary regulation and eventual legislation were passed to prohibit abortions being performed outside of hospitals. The Medical Services Act, or MSA, had a purpose to prohibit the privatization of certain medical services to maintain high quality health care systems. It prohibited access to certain medical services to being in the hospital only. Subsequent regulations, called the Medical Services Designation Regulation, listed prohibitions, including abortions. Issue. Is the Nova Scotia MSA ultra vires on the grounds that the act is in pith and substance criminal law? The answer here? Yes. Rule. When challenging legislation as invalid, they must characterize the legislator. Uh, the legislation. It is done by evaluating the pith and substance to determine if it is valid for that particular head of power. It is also important to look at the intrinsic and extrinsic evidence. The analysis here. The province argued that the legislation was valid under Section 927, the ability to regulate hospitals. Also, Section 9213, property and civil rights, and Section 9216, power over local matters. Morgan Tiller argues that the legislation fell under Section 9127, 
federal criminal power. And the court agreed that the legislation was focused on prohibiting abortions, which is a historically criminal law subject. They examined the purpose and the effect of the legislation. They found that the legal effect of the legislation did not follow the stated purpose, especially the extreme penalties imposed. They also examined ex extrinsic evidence. The related legislation, mischief, and legislative history, Hansard, found that the catalyst for this legislation was doc Dr. Morgenthaler's plan for a clinic. And the true purpose was to prohibit abortions as they were seen as socially undesirable and subject to punishment. The other objectives were incidental at best. In conclusion, in pith and substance, this act of legislation was criminal law. Therefore, the provincial legislation is ultra vires. The double aspect doctrine. Problems arise because it, because it was thought that assigning powers to section 91 and 92 would create watertight compartments. But this idea does not work in practice. There are subjects that fall into both heads of power validly for different reasons, and the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized the value. Privy Council, subjects which one aspect falls within section 91 and one aspect falls within section 92, there may well be valid federal and provincial laws dictating a person for the same thing with different required conduct. And if the conduct required is cumulative and not in conflict, is cumulative and not in conflict, they may operate together. Multiple Access Limited versus McCutcheon, 1982. The Ontario Securities Act, OSA, and the Canadian Corporations Act, CCA, had almost identical provisions prohibiting insider trading and shares trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange. There was accusation about insider trading happening, um, and they were charged under the Ontario legislation in part because the statute of limitations had already passed on the federal. They argued that the provincial legislation did not apply because it should be dealt with by the federal head of power because the CCA deals with federally incorporated companies such as multiple access issues. Is the provincial OSA, is the provincial OSA legislation ultra vires? No. Rule. If both legislations are valid and of equal importance, then both can be applicable. Mere duplication is not a conflict. Analysis. Started by looking at the pith and substance of each legislation. Uh, they decided the CAA and the OSA were both valid, but for different reasons, and they characterized and classified both. The CCA was valid under the federal POGG. The OSA was valid under 9213, property and civil rights. Because they were both valid and of equal importance, then the double aspect doctrine applies. And they recognize that watertight compartments do not work and there is inevitable overlap. In conclusion, the legislations were found to be cumulative in effect due to being almost identical, therefore not in conflict and allowed to operate in tandem. Next up, the Ancillary Powers Doctrine. This refers to situations where the large piece of legislation that is valid, but has a small piece that is considered invalid on its own, but is allowed to be valid because it helps the larger legislation function. Question. Does the impugn provision intrude or encroach on the power of the other branch of government? If so, to what extent? GM rule. Large legislation is valid, but a small piece is not valid on its own. It's a small, a small intrusion only needs a functional connection. Heavy intrusion needs to be a critical connection. Under Lacombe, the distinction between the two is not clear. In theory, you only need to show one part of the test is satisfied, but in practice, you will argue that both are satisfied. If you met the higher standard, then the lower standard is automatically met. You will cite from both cases the test is from GM, and Lacombe includes amendments and identifies the conclusion.
General Motors versus City National Leasing, 1989. City National Leasing claimed that General Motors was using unfair pricing policies prohibited under Section 31.1 of the Federal Combines Investigations Act based on General Motors giving better interest rates for buying versus leasing cars. Section 31.1 is a remedy provision. General Motors only challenged this section because the Combines Investigations Act is a huge piece of its legislation and they cannot strike, strike down the whole thing. Also, if this section is struck down, then it doesn't matter if the rules of the CIA are broken because they wouldn't have to pay the remedy anyways. Issues. Is Section 31.1 sufficiently integrated in the Combines Investigations Act so as to make it valid? Answer. Yes. Rule. This case determined the test for the ancillary powers doctrine, i.e. closely connectedness analysis. Look first to the larger statute. Is this valid legislation? Yes, in this case, the CIA was valid. Next, look at the provision. Is it valid? It's not valid on its own. Is the impugned provision sufficiently connected to the larger legislation to be considered valid? Answer here, yes. Test to determine how connected the provision is. How heavily, how heavily the provision intrudes relates to how connected it must be, how connected it must be the larger legislation. If it's not heavy, then it's functionally or rationally related. It just has to help it function. If it's very heavy, then it must be necessarily incidental. It must be critical to the legislation to be able to function. In practice, apply both and say if it is valid under both. So the problem is that it is subjective and it's hard to apply, therefore only need to make the factual argument. Conclusion, in General Motors, it is a small intrusion, therefore only needs to be functionally related, but would still have ha passed the heavier, stricter test anyways. Therefore, it was considered to be valid because it was saved by the ancillary power doctrine. So, subsequently, we have Quebec versus Lacombe in 2010, where the municip municipality introduced a zoning bylaw amendment that effectively prohibited the construction of an aerodrome, aerodrome on its own, this type of legislation would be invalid because aeronautics is a federal power. Uh, they were hoping that being an amendment, number 260, it could be saved by APD, uh, the Ancillary Power doc Doctrine, by being connected to a larger legislative scheme, uh, which was uh, amendment number 210. Issue. Was Amendment 260 sufficiently connected to number 210 to save it? Answer, no. Rule. Expanded the test set forth in the General Motors case, added the ability to examine amendments. This case recognizes the confusion with application of the test for ancillary powers, and the analysis is as follows. It explains the distinction between the ancillary powers doctrine and incidental effects. Ancillary power doctrine, ancillary powers doctrine small provision is outside of power but it can be saved by being sufficiently connected to the larger legislation um, and ie is within jurisdiction but touches on another head of power it's part of the classification incidental effects are within jurisdiction but touches on another head of power part of the classification incidental effects the analysis goes on to recognize that the courts have been confusing they said sorry but we aren't stopping either. So, to add further confusion, they use the ancillary power test on the an incidental effect test. The zoning provision is a ballot exercise of provincial power in this case, but the subject touches on a federal power, so is it connected to the other statute enough to save it? And the test as per the General Motors case was not satisfied. Number two, Amendment 260 was not sufficiently connected to be saved by Amendment 210 being valid. Conclusion. Amendments can be assessed under the ancillary powers test, and it was found to not be closely connected enough to be saved because the purpose of Amendment 260 is different than Amendment 210. Next, we have the Paramountcy Doctrine. Paramountcy Doctrine. Doctrine of Federal Paramountcy. Where 
There is an inconsistency between validly enacted but overlapping provincial and federal legislation. The provincial legislation is inoperative to the extent of the inconsistency. The provincial legislation is inoperative to the extent of the inconsistency. You cannot get to this point before determining that there are two pieces of valid legislation. You are only looking at the conflict between the legislation. In other words, compliance with one would violate the other, or one says yes and the other says no. The conflict was not addressed in the Constitution Act, so this stems from judge-made law. Uh, the legal fiction that a statute does something different than it is written. Uh, so reading down federal paramountcy equals inoperability. If the federal statute is removed, then the provincial is operable again. Okay. So we have Rothmans, Benson, and Hedges Incorporated versus Saskatchewan in 2005. Facts. Federal legislation, section 19, and subsections. Tobacco product advertising restrictions with exceptions to retailers. Provincial legislation. So section 6. Tobacco product advertising restrictions to all places people under 18 can go. Tobacco companies argued that the provincial legislation conflicts with the federal. In other words, paramountcy. Issues. Whether the Saskatchewan legislation is sufficiently inconsistent with the federal legislation to be rendered inoperative. Answer here, no. The rule. Test for paramountcy. 1. Impossibility of dual compliance. 2. Frustration of federal intent. Analysis. Two questions to answer. Here's the test. 1. Is there impossibility of dual compliance? 2. Is there frustration of the federal legislation purpose? In this case, 1. No. Dual compliance is possible. 2. There's no frustration here. Both had same intent of limiting use of tobacco, especially in youth. They argued that the federal legislation intended to create the right to advertising through Section 19 exceptions. Court said no. This goes against the purpose of the legislation. The provincial legislation was said to further the purpose of the federal legislation. And the federal attorney general stepped in and said that the federal intent and that they supported the Saskatchewan legislation. Conclusion, no conflict. Both continue to operate. Next case, Alberta versus Maloney in 2015. Facts. Maloney was in a car accident while uninsured. The province compensated the other party in the accident and sought to recover costs from Maloney under the Alberta Traffic Safety Act, the TSA. During the same time that Maloney claimed bankruptcy under the Federal Bankruptcy and Insolvencies Act, BIA, and was discharged of debts accordingly. Because of the discharge of debts, Maloney did not pay the full debt to Alberta and his driver's license was suspended. And Maloney argued that the provincial TSA conflicted and frustrated the purpose of the federal BIA. Province argued that there was no conflict because the TSA is regulatory in nature. Issues. Is provincial regulation rendered inoperative? Is provincial regulation rendered inoperative in respect to the federal legislation as per federal paramountcy? And the answer here is yes. The rule is the possibility of dual compliance was expanded by this case. Analysis. Court unanimously said there was conflict as the federal intent was frustrated, but the court went back to the impossibility of dual compliance part of the test. And this was odd because the paramountcy was already proven and there was no need to go back to this, but uh, this created a huge confusion on how this test works because it should be an either or test. Um, and the court was divided on whether there was impossibility of compliance, though Maloney could have just not had a license. The burden of establishing the conflict rests on the party bringing the case, in this case Maloney, bringing the appeal case. Conclusion, the TSA was rendered inoperable to the extent of the conflict with the BA. So presumably he got his license back. Next case, multiple access versus McCutcheon, 1982. Facts, same facts as above, found both legislations valid under the double aspect doctrine, now moving to a federal paramountcy argument. Issues, 
is the EOSA, rendered inoperative in respect to the CCA as per federal paramountcy? Answer, no. Mere duplication without conflict is not sufficient to invoke a paramountcy argument. Analysis, trial judge. There is no conflict in the sense that compliance to one law involves breach of the other. It would appear, therefore, that they can operate concurrently. There is no reason why duplication should be a case of inconsistency. On the contrary, it is the ultimate in harmony. Likewise, having choice of remedy due to duplicate provisions is not an inconsistency. The court can regulate this issue in order to not grant a double recovery. Uh, and then the other point, we are moving toward cooperative federalism in modern society. Governments no longer work in isolation of each other, increasing cooperation in ventures. Conclusion, the OSA was not rendered inoperative in this case. Next case, Bank of Montreal versus Hall, 1990. Facts. Hall was a farmer who took loans from the Bank of Montreal and was granted security interest on a piece of farm equipment under Section 88 of the Federal Bank Act, BA. Hall defaulted on the loan and BMO acted on the BA provision to seize the security interest property. BMO did not act in accordance with Section 27 of the Limitation of Civil Rights Act provisions requiring sufficient notice before seizure, which would then relieve the debtor of obligations. Uh, questioned, Hall questioned if BMO needed to follow the LCRA provisions in enforcing security interest as per the BA. Issues. Is provincial legislation rendered inoperative in respect to the federal BA as per federal paramountcy? Answer, yes. Rule. This case was the original application of paramountcy, the example of when federal intent is frustrated. Analysis. The BA created the security interest, but also defined the methods for realization and enforcement of that security interest. It made a uniform security mechanism that benefited the banks and borrows through allowing the bank to have insured collateral, which leads to less complicated and more affordable lending. The BA allows for immediate seizure of security interest. The LCRA forbids this, requiring notice. Compliance with the federal would have led to defiance of the provincial, forcing banks to oblige with all the idiosyncrasies and variables of provincial schemes would defeat the specific purpose that, uh, of creating the BA security interest. Conclusion, there's no room for the application of the sections of the LCRA. Therefore, they are rendered inapplicable and inoperative. Next, we have the Interjurisdictional Immunity Doctrine. This is a concept used in situations where a generally worded law is clearly valid in most of its applications, but in some of its application, it arguably overreaches, affecting a matter falling within a core area of the other level of the government's jurisdiction. When interjurisdictional immunity is invoked, the court will read, the, read down the provincial and federal statute to protect the core of exclusive federal provincial powers from encroachment. So reading down is a technique of interpretation used to save statutes from constitutional challenges. Words are interpreted to apply only to matters within the jurisdiction of the enacting body. This technically can be used for both federal and provincial legislation, but today it has been only used on federal. Uh, so here's the established precedent for where the interjurisdictional immunity doctrine applies. 1. Federal elections. 2. Telecommunications. 3. Interprovincial railways and shipping. 4. Trucking. 5. Postal service. 6. Banking. 7. Aeronautics. 8. Navigation and shipping. 9. The military. 10. Aboriginal peoples and lands. 11. The RCMP. 12. Federal parks. 13. Criminal procedure. 14. Fisheries. 15. Offshore resources. Interprovincial, uh, interprovincial undertakings of transportation communications are as long as they cross a border or boundary. Let's look at some cases. Canadian Western Bank versus the Queen in Wright of Alberta, 2007. Facts. In 1991, 
the Federal Bank Act was revised to allow banks to promote certain types of insurance, while their core services are still deposits and loans. In 2000, Alberta enacted changes to its Insurance Act to make federally chartered banks subject to the provincial licensing scheme governing the promotion of insurance products. Banks selling insurance argued that federal le legislation had sole authority over banks under Section 9115. Therefore, the provincial legislation did not affect them. Issues. Does the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity apply? No. Rule. The doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity should be used with restraint as a last resort. If no other doctrines resolve the issue, it will only be applied to cases with precedence of the existence of an undertaking. The test? 1. Does the legislation entrench on a core federal undertaking? And 2. Does it impair the core of the undertaking? Analysis. Not looking at conflict, looking at if provincial, usually, legislation trenches on federal, entrenches on federal power too much. The old test was, does the legislation affect the core? If the, legisl if the legislation did affect the core, it would be read down. And uh, the SSC said this is n too easy, not strict enough. The, the broad application of the doctrine of the interjurisdictional immunity doctrine can have several negative effects. It can frustrate the goals of cooperative federalism. It can create uncertainty as to what is within the exclusive powers of each branch of government. It can create legal vacuums. And it runs the risk of creating a centralizing tendency in constitutional interpretation through federal favoritism. The broad application would also seem unnecessary because Parliament can enact sufficiently precise legislation and cover the field through paramountcy. For all these reasons, the court does not favor this doctrine or using it as a first recourse for division of powers disputes. New test. It's not enough just to have an effect. It must impair the core of the federal undertaking. The core equals something absolutely indispensable central component to the federal entity. So we needs to need to figure out whether there's a federal undertaking first before even starting the IJI test. Uh, the federal undertaking, person, work, or thing needs precedence that shows us. And then two, does it impair the core? Is it a federal undertaking? Does it impair the core? Conclusion, in this case, banking is a federal undertaking, but insurance is not part of the core, therefore it's not impaired. Let's look at Quebec versus the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association in 2010. Facts. Residents built an aerodrome on their property in Quebec. Registration to the Federal Minister of Transport is optional, but then it makes airstrips subject to the Federal Aeronautics Act, which, which says construction and operation does not need prior permission. And the land it was built on was designated as agricultural land by the provincial requiring uses other than agriculture to get special authorization from the commissioner. This was not done as such they were ordered to demolish their airstrip and they argued that the airstrip is not subject to provincial legislation based on the IJI as aeronautics are a federal power issue. Whether provincial ARPELAA applies in the situation where it impacts on the federal power over aeronautics? Answer, no. Rule. This case is an example of the CWB test being applied and it clarifies what impair means for this test. Analysis, here's the test. Does the provincial legislation entrench on a core federal undertaking? Jurisprudence establishes that parliament has power over aeronautics, commercial aviation, and by extension aerodromes supported under the federal POGG power, and the ARPELAA clearly entrenches on this core. Test 2. Does it impair the core of federal undertaking? Impairment suggests an impact that not only affects the core federal power, but does so in a way that seriously or significantly um, entrenches on the federal 
power. So not just affecting, but seriously or significantly uh, affects the federal power. This case uh, is, is nothing but the location to place airports. Uh, therefore, uh, this is being impaired. Conclusion, the IJI is applicable in this case. Aeronautics are a core federal competency. Provisional legislation does impair this competency by forcing federal legislators to choose between allowing the province to restrict the locations or by specifically legislating to override this, forcing parliament to adopt a more burdensome legislative scheme. Federal paramountcy could work here, but um, it is what would force the burdensome legislative scheme. POG, P-O-G-G, -G, Peace, Order, and Good Government. Peace, Order, and Good Government. So P-O-G-G -G powers come from the preamble of Section 91. It shall be lawful for the Queen, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate and House of Commons, to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Canada, in relation to all matters not coming within the classes or subjects by this act assigned exclusively to the legislators of the provinces. POG is a part of validity and specifically about classifying the head of power. If a case meets the POG requirements, it is not under any other HOP in practice, it is not under any other head of power in practice, and on the exam you will argue the alternative to advance. The analysis. Three branches. Emergency, temporary, early cases. The national concern doctrine, permanent, subjects newly deemed to be of national concern. The test is laid out in Zellerbach. In other words, aeronautics, radio, NCR. Is it also inflation and environment? And the third branch, gap and residual powers. Permanent, not a topic we focus on. References regarding the Anti-Inflation Act of 1976, Facts, Emergency Powers Doctrine. Uh, so this got to court as a reference question from the Governor and Council to the Supreme Court of Canada. There was a 20-month period of double-digit high inflation and unemployment rates, which had never happened in Canada before, and this caused panic of a looming economic crisis. The Anti-Inflation Act was enacted in 1974, this legislation gave the federal government and provincial, if they opted in, ability to control price and profits, wages and salaries, dividends, etc. And there was a crazy amount of extrinsic evidence submitted in this case, likely because the Supreme Court of Canada realized they are not economic experts, and this case could have huge economic consequences. Issue. Is the Anti-Inflation Act valid federal le legislation under POG? Yes. Rule. This case determined the test to be used to determine validity, validity under the Emergency Powers Doctrine. Analysis. Was thought that this case was unquestionably, unquestionably valid under the National Concern Doctrine. Did not even consider that it would fall under the Emergency Powers Doctrine. Characterization. The majority character, characterizes the law as being designed to contain and reduce inflation. The court bases this characterization on both the preamble and extrinsic evidence, as well as support from having similar powers under other Section 91 provisions. Classification. They thought it was valid under the National Concern Doctrine, and started by arguing the alternative and classifying under the Emergency Powers Doctrine, because if it was valid here, you did not need to look at the National Concern Doctrine. And the majority of the court agreed that it was valid under the Emergency Permit uh, emergency powers doctrine as it was a temporary provision and um, they, were, they were criticized for not having any language of an emergency in the legislation and having an opt-in function for the for the provincial conclusion so this act was uh, the anti-inflation act was held valid because the federal government had a rational basis for claiming an emergency situation and did not need to actually prove that there was a real emergency after this case, the Emergency Act was enacted as a guideline for declaring a formal emergency. The dissent said, when legislation controls these types of things, it is a huge encroachment on provinces and it should be ultra-virus by default. 
They argued that this would not be valid as a national concern doctrine either, because inflation is not a new subject. They argued that this would not be valid under the emergency powers doctrine either, because they said you need a formal declaration of emergency to justify this much intrusion on provincial powers. They also argued there was no rational basis for an emergency because this was enacted as a national concern. The test here, did Parliament have a rational basis for thinking there was an emergency? They do not have to prove there was an emergency, only that they could have rationally thought that there was. They use extrinsic evidence to support this claim, legislative climate, Hansard, etc. It must be temporary to be valid under the emergency powers doctrine. Was the Emergency Act followed? Did they declare an official emergency? This is just legislation, so it's not always fatal without it, but it is much harder to prove the rational basis without it. So the test, one, rational basis for thinking an emergency. Was it temporary? Was the emergency act followed? Did they declare an emergency? Cases, R versus Crown Zellerbach Canada in 1988. Facts, national concern doctrine. Logging operations on Vancouver Island. This was a logging operation on Vancouver Island. They were using a water area for storing logs. These logs left debris in the water and they moved the debris to another area. They had a permit to dump the debris, but not for the area that it was moved to, which was in violation of the Ocean Dumping Control Act. Relevant provision, section 4.1, prohibits dumping all substances except with a permit. This was controversial because the act had a prohibition that infringed on the province's power. The distinction between freshwater and seawater was not clear, and it allowed the infringement to go very far inland. Issue, is Section 4.1 of the Ocean Dumping Control Act valid? Answer, yes. Rule. This case set the test for validity under the National Concern Doctrine. One, is it a subject of new concern? Two, SDI, the Provincial Inability Test. Three, scale of provincial impact. Analysis. Marine pollution is not under an enumerated mean. That is why POG is examined here. Characterizing. Purpose. Regulate the dumping of substances at sea to prevent harm to the marine environment. Practical effect. Supposed to protect marine and human health. Classification. The pro province argued that Section 92.5, Management of Provincial Lands, uh, Section 10, Local Works, Section 13, Property Civil Rights, 16, Local and Private. Canada argued under section 9112 fisheries. The court said no because there were effects on this industry but the effects are much broader. Also there was no evidence that this violation affected fisheries in any way. This was under national control doc doctrine because it was a national issue that the provinces cannot deal with on their own. So the national concern doctrine argument Pollution is not a new thing, but it's changing in nature and it has the potential to affect other areas of the country. The SDI argument was based on not being able to distinguish between ocean water and fresh water within provinces, making water an indivisible matter to provide certainty. The provincial inability test proves SDI because if one province doesn't take care, the pollution will spread. The impact on the province was argued to be not that extensive. Conclusion. Section 4.1 was validly enacted under the National Concern Doctrine of POG. Must be careful of POG application because it gives the federal government permanent power on the matter. The test. Number one, to determine if the entity is a matter that can be subject to POG. It must be a new subject matter since Confederation or it existed in Confederation but has changed in nature since then. It is newly of national concern. Two, singleness, distinctiveness, and indivisibility, SDI. Singleness, distinctiveness, and indivisibility, SDI, that distinguishes it from a matter of provincial concern. This was meant to be three different things, but is usually examined as one piece. Three, scale of impact on the province that is reconcilable with the fundamental distribution of legislative power. In other words, the impact that is not so bad this cannot be determined definitively. You just have to acknowledge it. Four, 
In order to determine this, you need to look at the provincial inability test. The provincial inability test is what would happen if one province did not regulate the issue well. Case, Friends of the Oldman River Society versus Canada, 1992. Facts, National Concern Doctrine. Alberta wanted to build a dam. The project was approved by the federal government following the federal legislation. FOMRS, Friends of the Old Man River Society, wanted an environmental impact study done, so they argued that the federal legislation was ultra vires. Issue is a provincial project with environmental impacts subject to federal law. Yes, but also provincial. Rule Legislation of the environment is a subject matter subject to the double aspect doctrine. Analysis this case challenged the Zellerbach decision that seemed to give the power over the environment to the feds. It argued it should be a double aspect subject matter. The court agreed, as both Section 91 and Section 92 have categories that would apply to regulating the environment. Conclusion The environment can be under the NCD or the POG, but it is also a double aspect subject matter. economic regulation, trade and commerce. Provincial powers over economic regulation. Intraprovincial trade and commerce, section 9213, property and civil rights, local business, local matters, local production. Regulate trade and commerce within the province, limited by the intent of legislation. You cannot use this to steal power from the feds. This is interpreted very broadly. Carnation case involving the provincial production of evaporated milk. The province may regulate over local production as long as the aim and intent of the regulation is the local production. If the intention was to only regulate local production, then the legislation would be intra vires. If the intention was to affect interprovincial trade, then it would be ultra vires to the province. Therefore, must look at the intent of the legislation under section 9213. This commonly happens in agricultural context because of the high competition between provinces. Provinces want to make legislation to protect themselves and likely end up overstepping in their power. Uh, Manitoba versus Manitoba Egg and Poultry Association in 1971. Facts. Ontario had lots of cheap eggs. Quebec had a lot of cheap chickens. Manitoba was being badly affected by Quebec's legislation, which was clearly ultra vires. They responded by making legislation that was very creative. Past legislation made it in the exact way that Quebec had done. And they asked the Supreme Court in Manitoba, Manitoba about validity, knowing it would pass, with the hopes of a Supreme Court of Canada appeal so that the decision would be binding on all provinces. Issue. Does Manitoba have the power to regulate the marketing of extra-provincial eggs? Answer, no. Rule. What the legislation aimed at, its intent, matters greatly. Example of the ultra vires trade and commerce legislation by province. Local production is provincial power. Inter-provincial trade or marketing is included in the federal powers. Analysis. This legislation was clearly made with the intent to affect interprovincial trade. Therefore, ultra vires to the province. If legislation is made with the intent of regulating local production and trade only, but has incidental effects on interprovincial trade, then it could be saved by the APD. Uh, the conclusion, this war ended because the federal government finally came up with a cooperative legislation solution reference the agricultural products marketing act it is possible to set up cooperative legislation between provinces where both would be valid and this would make interprovincial trade under the power of each province rather than the feds section 121 free trade between provinces no duties or tariffs this just address of tariffs not the limits to what can go between provinces uh, BC preventing alcohol from Alberta to be brought over the border is allowed. 
but they couldn't put a tariff on Alberta liquor being sold in BC. Section 92A, Natural Resources. It allows for additionally provincial power over non-renewable natural resources, and for example, Alberta oil and gas, BC, forestry, etc. This was added during the amendments in 1982, subsection 1. If something is listed here, it is the exclusive power of the province. Subsection 2. It is allowed to impact interprovincial trade and commerce only if there is no price discrimination. Subsection 3. Nothing in subsection 2 derogates or removes from the authority of Parliament to enact laws about that subject, and federal paramountcy doctrine applies to any conflicts that may arise. If a fact pattern on the exam touches on natural resources, check if it is in section 92A. If so, federal paramountcy applies. Offshore minerals. The rule is, the offshore mineral area was within the provincial jurisdiction at the time of confederation, then it is within the provincial jurisdiction. Otherwise, it is within the federal jurisdiction under POG and its residual capacity. Federal powers over economic regulation continued section 91-2, regulation of trade and commerce. Parsons case determines two branches. Branch one, interprovincial slash international branch. Branch two, general trade and commerce power. This is interpreted very narrowly. The Privy Council limited power so much that the Supreme Court of Canada is trying to find ways to increase the scope now. Interprovincial and international trade and commerce. Classen and colloidal cases expanded on the APD to apply to the federal trade and commerce power. Cite together always on the exam. These cases feed off of each other to come up with a rule. This is the Supreme Court of Canada's way of saying take a look at APD to see if the Section 91 to power can be expanded. General regulation of trade. Rarely used and rarely successful. Basically only ever been used in a General Motors case where the test was designed. It is the regulation of something that doesn't particularly cross the borders regulating such things as competition. Case, Lobot Brewer Breweries of Canada Limited versus Canada, 1980. Facts, on its own, this case does not tell us much. It needs to be read with the GM case, with the General Motors case. Food and Drug Act Section 6 states that, as per the standards that are established in this act, there can be no sale under the standard unless it actually meets the standard. Light beer means a lower alcohol content in the beer. Labatt broke this rule as they produced a beer with higher alcohol content than the standard, but sold it as a light beer. Issue. Whether regulations for light beer were ultra beers to the federal government? Answer. Yes. Rule. Specific industry is local matter, not federal general trade and commerce power. Analysis. This was not an interprovincial trade and commerce question, therefore, general trade and commerce question. Problem. The legislation has a very specific scope, and this makes it very local and not a national concern. It dealt with a very specific industry within the provinces, brewing industry. Therefore, it is a provincial power, not a federal power. The dissent said this legislation was to control the standard across the country, and in this case, Labatt could transfer products across the country because of their many brewing locations. But in the conclusion, it was found that this legislation was ultra vires and Labatt's light beer was allowed. Case, General Motors of Canada versus City National Leasing, 1989. This case was unique because it laid out two divisions of powers test in one decision, the APD and the general trade power. This case came to court because City National Leasing alleged that General Motors was violating the CIA for using unfair interest rates creating unfair competition between other car rental companies. Issue, whether Section 31.1 of the Combines Investigation Act and the Act itself are valid. Answer, yes. The rule, set the five criteria for the Federal General Trade and Commerce Power analysis. Outlines the General Trade and Commerce Powers test. One, legislation is part of a general regulatory scheme. Subsection A, legislation identifies defines required and prohibited content. B. Legislation creates investigatory procedures. C. 
legislation establishes a remedial and punitive mechanism. Two, scheme is monitored or overseen by a regulatory agency. Three, legislation is concerned with trade as a whole, not a particular industry. Four, legislation is of a nature that provinces are constitutionally incapable of enacting it jointly or severally. Five, failure to include one or more provinces in legislation would jeopardize the successful operation of the scheme in other parts of the country. But this is not an exhaustive list, and if you meet all parts of the test, you still may not be successful. The conclusion was, the application of this test found that there was a regulatory scheme, and a regulatory agency was concerned with trade as a whole, and that the provinces would be incapable alone, and the failure of a province would jeopardize, therefore, the legislation was valid. Case. Reference regarding the Securities Act. Reference question, 2011. Facts. Was a reference question from the federal government to find out if it was within the federal power to create a federal securities regulator, even though the provinces have their own already? Issue. Whether the proposed Securities Act is within parliamentary authority under the general trade power. Answer. No. Rule. If the federal government wants to use the general trade and commerce power, it must have evidence that the issue is of national concern for them to assume that power. Analysis. The purpose behind this legislation was to create uniformity in security regulation. Only questioned about the validity under the general trade and commerce power. It's odd that they didn't ask about constitutionality under criminal law, interprovincial trade, ancillary powers. It's also odd because they restricted themselves on where validity could be found, as it could have been possibly valid under criminal. Also odd because it is not quite a last resort option, but it is not a favored doctrine. The subject matter of the legislation is securities. We know from prior cases that this is a double aspect doctrine subject matter, i.e. the multiple access case. So went back to the General Motors case and applied this test. One, regulatory scheme. Yes, this was the point of the legislation. Two, regulatory agency. Yes, again, this was the purpose. Three, trade as a whole. No, this is a particular industry, the securities industry. Four, provincial independence. No, this province is already, all the provinces are already regulating themselves. Five, provincial dissent. No, again, C, step four. Conclusion, classification cannot be supported under general trade and commerce. Uh, the act does have a national dimension, but it's too invasive on provincials. Maybe if it was rewritten, then it could be uh, valid under the double aspect doctrine. Criminal law. Federal powers over criminal law, section 9127. Well, section 912 was read to be very restrictive. Section 9127 has been read to be extremely broad. Different cases set different parts of the criminal law test. Cite each case separately for each part. Uh, case, Proprietary Articles Trade Association versus Canada in 1931. Facts, not very important and very dense. Rule, it added to the criminal law test the form, in other words, prohibition and penalty. Analysis, allowed the federal government to make new crimes. Set part of the criminal law test specifically the form, i.e. prohibition and penalty, if the statute has these two things, it has the criminal law form. Problem, any statute could become criminal law by having those two things, too much could be criminalized. Case, reference regarding section 5A of the Dairy Industry Act, the margin reference, 1949. Facts, came to court as a reference question, is Section 5 of the Dairy Industry Act ultra vires to Parliament? It sounded like a trade and commerce statute, but they asked if they could make it valid under the criminal law power. Issue, whether Section 5A of the Dairy Industry Act is a valid enactment of the criminal power. Answer, no. Rule, added to criminal law test, legislation must have a criminal intent. Criminal legislation must have a criminal intent. Analysis went through the history of criminal law, stated again that new crimes can be established. What evil is being addressed here? 
i.e. peace, order, health, morality, security, added to the test must have a criminal intent behind the legislation. In other words, look to the purpose, the application of this case. The court said that the purpose was colorable. They said it was about health, but was it really to limit the trade and commerce aspects of the dairy industry. It did not have a criminal law purpose. Conclusion. Section 5A of the Dairy Industry Act is in part ultra vires, uh, the Parliament of Canada. This is important because it is one of the only cases with something where something was not found to be valid under criminal law power. Next case, you have RJR McDonald Incorporated versus Canada in 1995. Facts. This started the expansion of the criminal law power, and it examined the Tobacco Products Control Act. This act prohibited all advertising and promotion of tobacco products offered for sale in Canada. Exemption, the advertising of foreign tobacco products in imported publications, international products. Legislation also required the display of unattributed health warnings on all tobacco products. Issue, was this legislation ultra vires to the federal government? Answer, no. Rule. Criminal law is plenary. Criminal legislation may contain exemptions and regulatory elements as long as the pith and substance of the legislation is criminal law. Health is a criminal law intent. Analysis. Criminal law is plenary in nature. It's standalone and extremely broad. It's not likely to be limited. Basic requirements in criminal law. You have the criminal law form, prohibition, plus penalty, the PATA, PATA. The criminal law purpose. What evil is being addressed? Evil is a term of art. It's from the margin case. The prohibition was a prohibition of selling a product without the warnings. The penalties were financial. What was at issue here? It was not the form. It was the criminal law intent. And this case talked about how the problem with tobacco is the health issue, which is a criminal law purpose. This was a means to the end analysis. The end was protecting health, which is a criminal power. The means can be chosen by the feds. Restrictions on advertising. Exemptions. More regulatory in nature and not criminal power. Not a hard rule, though. You can have exemptions. Still be criminal in nature. I.e., here the exemption did not remove the criminal law power because the exemption was only about 1% of the total advertising. Dissent. The evil here, the intent, was smoking, which is not illegal in itself. Only the advertising of it, which lends to being more regulatory in nature. And... They had different statistics about what advertising is foreign and exempted, claiming 65%, which would make this law ineffective and more regulatory in nature. Conclusion, found that the legislation was intra vires under the criminal law power, section 9127. Case R v. Hydro-Quebec, 1997. Facts. Case got before the court by violating an interim court order under the CEPA to limit the emission of PCBs. Hydro-Quebec argued that the legislation is not valid. The Crown argued validity of CEPA under POG and Section 9127. Issue is Part 2 of the CEPA and its regulations. Ultra vires Parliament? No. Answer is no. Rule. If there is a criminal form and purpose, then just because there is a strong regulatory scheme, it can be criminal still, because criminal law is plenary and not frozen in time, and the environment is a criminal law intent. Analysis. The feds thought this legislation would be valid under the natural concern doctrine and POG based on its preamble. SEPA, part two, sets out a scheme that looks very regulatory in nature, describes a process to prohibit substances, which is not an actual prohibition in itself. Based on Old Man River, we know that the environment is a, a double aspect doctrine. The evil intent here is pollution and environment are a recognized aspect of criminal purpose. Basically, this case was allowed under section 9127 rather than POG because 9127 doesn't take away total power from provinces, whereas POG would be a permanent removal of the province's power. It's odd because there should have just been analysis that the test was met, not which test would be better. The Supreme Court of Canada found that there was a prohibition and a penalty and that the long process led to the precision of restrictions. The dissent said, this is all regulatory, not criminal. Don't even know if your substance is prohibited until the process is completed. An important aspect of criminal law is knowing what is and is not a crime. 
and that this legislation was made to prevent things via a regulatory agency. Conclusion, the imputed legislation was a valid under criminal law power, section 9127, and they did not need to address POG. Case, reference re, Firearms Act 2000, rule, regulations of firearms is valid under section 9127. Case, Quebec versus Canada, 2015, facts. Quebec expressed its intentions to create its own provincial gun control scheme and asked Canada to give it the data on long guns connected with the province. The federal government refused. As a result, Quebec challenged the constitutionality of the federal law providing for destruction of the data and sought an order requiring the federal government to turn it over. There was no criminal law form, no prohibition or penalty, but it was valid because it was connected to the previous legislation that was valid under the criminal law power. Rule. If the rescinded legislation was valid criminal law, then legislation under it will be valid even if it is or even if it was rescinded. Okay. Provincial power to regulate morality in public order. So section 9214, section 9215, not truly criminal, but very similar. Section 9214 is administration of justice in the province. Section 9215 is corollary provision which cannot be valid by itself, but must be connected to another provincial head of power, usually 9213 or 9216, and if so, it will be valid, even if there is criminal form or purpose. In case, Nova Scotia uh, Board of Censors versus McNeil, 1978. Facts, Nova Scotia Theaters and Amusement Acts and Regulations established a system of licensing and regulating the showing of films censoring films they did not approve. Breach of a prohibition resulted in the monetary penalty and revocation of the theater owner's license. McNeil, a private citizen, brought de declaratory action so he could see Last Tango in Paris, which was going to be censored by the board for a graphic rape scene. Issue. Whether the Theaters and Amusements Act and regulations are validly enacted by the province, answer yes. The provincial legislators are allowed to legislate morality if one, the objects are anchored in a provincial head of power, and two, the legislation does not conflict with the federal legislation. The analysis, the majority found the act and associated regulations to be valid under section 9213 and section 9216. The act gave power to ban movies and impose a penalty if theaters do show the movie. The pith and substance of the act, dealing with property films which take place wholly within the province. Therefore, Characterized, directed at property and civil rights, and valid under Section 9213. Based on dissent, the majority should have just said, we find this valid because it was anchored in provincial HOP, head of powers. The dissent said, determination of what is decent and obscene is within the exclusive power or the fe of the federal government under criminal law. Provincial legislators, provincial legislators, are allowed to legislate where moral considerations are involved, but only if the objects are anchored in a provincial head of power and the legislation does not conflict with the federal legislation. In this case, the dissent feels there is not enough of an anchor to make this valid. Conclusion. The act and regulations as a whole are valid under section 9213 and 16, and either was an anchor for section 9215. Case. Westendorp versus the Queen, 1983. Facts. Calgary enacted bylaw 9022 under section 9213. Section 6.1 of this bylaw was an amendment and explicit provision dealing with prostitution, which stated section, section 6.12 being on the street for purpose of prostitution, section 6.13 communicating with or approaching someone for the purpose of prostitution, section 6.1 had more significant penalties than any other provisions in the bylaw issue whether section 6.1 of the bylaw can be upheld as valid answer no rule the provinces do not have a power that extends beyond any double aspect principle they cannot target a specific crime and relate it to a provincial head of power analysis did an apd analysis but this was before general motors came out with the test it stated the purpose was to control the streets it was clear that this amendment was for the purpose of preventing prostitution, which is a well-known federal power. The APD analysis um, was different in nature to the other provisions, 
it was an attempt to control or punish prostitution. There's not a property question here. And it was not found to be necessary for the rest of the, the bylaw to function. Section 6.1 stands on its own. Nothing before or after relates to it. It's intrusive and it's unconnected to the bylaw. It's activated only by what is said by a person referring to the offer of sexual services. The pith and substance. Legislation was criminal law aimed at stopping prostitution, which is a federal power. The other purposes were colorable. The purpose stated was not what they were trying to do. Colorability. If purpose concerned with if the purpose was the concern of controlling the streets, why didn't the city enact legislation targeting all congregations? Background. The feds made activities around prostitution illegal, but not prostitution itself. Cities were not happy with this, so they made their own legislation. And that the feds knowing cities are not happy is a strong indication of colorability. Conclusion. Section 6.1 was a blatant attempt to ban prostitution and is in pith and substance criminal law and is therefore ultra vires. Case. Chatterjee versus Ontario in 2009. Facts. The Ontario CRA authorizes the forfeiture of proceeds of unlawful activity. Property may be forfeited if, on a balance of probabilities, it is determined that the property constituted the proceeds of a crime in general without further specificity. The purpose is aimed at mitigating the cost of crime on the promise. There is a similar federal law power, but it is aimed at preventing people from benefiting from crimes. Rule. In cases of overlap, it is necessary for the court to identify the dominant feature of an impugned measure. Analysis. The provincial CRA has a stated different purpose than the federal legislations, because the intent is not to criminalize, rather to recoup costs or losses from criminal activities. This is a provincial property objective, not a criminal objective, therefore valid. Federal and provincial power over Aboriginal people. Section 9124, Indians and land reserved for the Indians. Federal power to legislate all Arab all Aboriginal issues in Canada. Uh, the Constitutional Act of 1982 also has Section 35, Aboriginal Rights. Case, De La Gamuk versus British Columbia, 1997. Rule, federal government has exclusive power over legislation over Aboriginal people. Only the feds can extinguish Aboriginal title and only title from before 1982. Provincial government can legislate generally. Some laws may apply to the Aboriginal people. Delegamook De decided that IJI protects the core of the power relating to Aboriginals as defined in Section 9124. Therefore, law of general application and provincial cannot impair that federal core power where they have the exclusive power over legislation over Aboriginal people and are the only ones that can extinguish the Aboriginal title and only title from before 1982. The Silicon Nation versus British Columbia in 2014. This case limited the core of what is a Aboriginal powers under federal powers, section 9124. IJI does not apply to Aboriginal title or treaties, and we're not sure about the rest of the Aboriginal rights analysis. This decision was that IJI no longer limits provinces to rules of general application for Aboriginal title. In Obiter, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada stated that the IJI is not available here if you are arguing that it impairs Aboriginal title. Obiter is important because it is not binding, but it is coming from the uh, Supreme Court of Canada. It, it is highly persuasive. It is thought that this case may have extinguished IJI for all Aboriginal rights, but that is unsettled. The issue is we already have Section 35, so we do not need two constitutional tests for Aboriginal title.